Hello humans, welcome uh, to this next chapter of our series where we dive into the uh, two-dimensional aspect of our work. Uh, basically by now you, you should have a full understanding or at least at least a basic understanding of how 3D works, how the pipeline works, how to generate 3D meshes. But now we have to talk about uh, how um, we're going to be you know, painting them with 2D um, textures, so, uh, 2D pictures, etc. Like these are 2D objects. So uh even though you've already had a slight brush like a to like a little quick brush with substance painter i did not actually explain anything there i was just i was just going through a couple of things in order to hook up the the workflow between these two programs however in this video we'll be diving things into things proper i just want to make sure that you understand how color works um how it's calculated what kind of blending modes there are and what kind of maps there uh, there are so we're going to go all, all over all of this stuff um, in this video. Now the reason I have Photoshop open over here is because uh, I, I think it's the easiest uh, software you know to use in order to demonstrate what I'm trying to say here. Now obviously if you've used Photoshop before you might be familiar with most, most of these terms so you might not need to watch this video although I would recommend against it okay. Um, now obviously if you haven't done anything with Photoshop you'll have absolutely no clue what we're doing right now and that's you know that's totally fine because at the end of the day uh, we won't be using Photoshop and although it was the original default choice of uh, texturing for you know game developers like decades ago decades ago five years ago well, whenever you're watching this you know Photoshop and still is you know you can still do some pretty cool stuff in Photoshop although Painter is quickly overtaking that position as the primary texturing software package uh, unlike you know let's say 10 years ago when there were there were a lot of people who were using Photoshop uh, to a very effective degree by the way mind you so um, Photoshop is still a very powerful tool however it's made for photos and as such uh, it is not ideal for texturing um, but you know if, if you gotta make do with what you got so if you don't have substance painter feel free to learn Photoshop and use it I will not be going uh, over the Photoshop layout or what the tools are doing and this and that but I'll give you the basics of color and uh, you know uh, 2D picture planes it's uh, basically so um, they are universal across all software applications so uh, whatever we you learn here will be applicable in Photoshop uh, basically ZBrush right now ZBrush is a modeling toolkit uh, basically anything that works with colors will be using the exact same universal uh, you know set of um, <clears throat> terms and uh, functions most likely okay so let me just open this image over here and if you are of an avid artist uh, in the real world you will quickly recognize uh, and realize that uh, this looks a lot like a basic color pattern in other words um, with this color set you can create every other color available to the uh, sort of uh, color spectrum that people can see now unlike the real world where you use red blue and, uh, and yellow okay um, in, order, in order to create mixes of them and create other colors which are you know essentially infinite in terms of shades etc when it comes to computers uh the uh, yellow is replaced by green for particular reasons now, i'm not going to dive into the technical aspect of why this is the case uh but just take it for fa for a flat value that uh, red green and blue are the default colors and you can build any other color out of these three uh out of the set of uh, basics okay um, now there's the, the color theory actually is a, is a very deep theory now I'm not I'm not a colorist or chromatist or whatever it's called I forget um, so I don't study color I, and I, I really don't care much for color in such a depth now I only care for color for it to be represented in the game uh, as I see it you know, whenever I work with it uh, also it's important to understand uh, you know in terms of memory how it's affected and also you know basically how it's rendered so that you understand what exactly it is that the player will see after all uh, now in this case we can certainly see that uh, the uh, you know red and green create yellow the green and blue create uh, cyan and uh, blue and red create magenta and you know if you have any common sense in terms of uh, your color understanding uh, ie you're not color blind you will quickly see how these two you know melt together very well and if you take a look here you could even you know sort of have a li this little optical illusion where you could still see the red or yellow or magenta if you just try to focus in by uh, 
driving your gaze along one of these lines. At least that happens for me. Now, obviously, this is not a color. This is only this is basically white, and I will talk about why this is in a moment. Now, before actually we go ahead, ahead and open Photoshop, well, real quick, I want to ask you something. What do you know about RGB? Just think about yourself. Uh, think this to yourself. What do you know about RGBs? Um, what do you know about about bits? And what is an 8-bit uh, like image? What is a 16-bit image and a 32-bit image? Now, the more astute among you will will you know answer say, well, you know, the bigger bits, the bigger the bits, the better the the better the quality of the image. Which you know, it doesn't take a genius or a scientist to answer that question. Uh, and you wouldn't be you be, you'd be correct, right? So the bigger the the bigger the bits, the more depth of um, of your image. However, there's a little bit more to go here when it comes to bits. First of all, we have to understand that uh, computers program uh, and code and just work in binary, okay? And binary is being denominated as a series of zeros and ones, right? Because a computer is essentially a giant set of switches. One is off, the other one is uh, on. There's a couple of others that are off and another one that's on. And this particular combination of on and off creates a unique result, okay? Uh, obviously, you know, we've come a long way from the huge rooms where uh, you have like thousands of light bulbs, which are your essentially on and off switches. In this case, we got transistors. Now, as, as of now, the smallest transistor, I believe, is uh, eight nanometers in the uh, CPU cores. So you have billions and billions of these things. Uh, that's why it shouldn't be too difficult to imagine, you know, such a primitive and basic method of on and off being able to explain and do so much simply just by miniaturizing it and packing more and more transistors together, you can get a lot more um, out of it. But uh, let's not dive into the hardware aspect of it, okay? Because there's there's a long enough conversation to be had there, especially if you're, if you're a uh, tech head. Okay, <clears throat> let's continue about this. So we've got the binary code, which is like 0, 1, 0, 0, 1, whatever, 1, 0. Uh, now this uh, binary code uh, could also be used with hexadecimal, like be translated into hexadecimal and into decimal, uh, obviously. So let's say you have one zero one zero one zero one zero. Um, these are eight numbers. Now, in order to represent anything, um, you need a particular set of values. If you've ever been uh, working with any type of images before, you would know that red, green, and blue respectively go from zero to 55. And zero being the lowest possible value of a particular channel. So as you can see, we got three channels, right? You can think of this as three channels. You got the red, the green, and the blue, and the blending between these channels creates the colors that we need. The more, the brighter a particular channel, the more, um, you know, the more it will overtake or compete with another channel. So these are the brightest possible channels over here. Now we're going to go into brightness and, uh, you know, um, transparency later in this video. I just wanted to make sure that you understand, think of these as channels, as individual separate entities. And each of these needs a value. So how red is something? How can you tell a computer how red is something? Well, if the computer knew that a red can only be from 0 to 256, uh, well, in this case, 255, because uh, a bit after you, after you, after all, only can has can have two values, a zero and one. So you get two values with each bit. You have to multiply that by the amount of uh, bits that you basically values that you have. So uh, an eight bit image would be a two to the eighth, which would be two times two times two times two uh, times two eight times basically, and that would uh, equal to 256 values. Basically, anytime you want to see how many values you have in a byte or in whatever, in any sort of information container, uh, information unit, you can simply multiply two by the amount of bits that you got. Okay, so uh, eight bits, two to the eighth, 16 bits, two to the 16th, 32 bits, two to the 30, 32nd, right? Although 32 bits is a ridiculous, ridiculous amount of uh, bits per channel because um, essentially, you do realize that uh, from zero to 255, or AKA 256 values, means that you 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 can legitimately distinguish between 256 shades of gray. Okay, uh, uh, shades of red. My bad. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, shades of red. So if you think about this for a second, this this is a very it requires a very precise eye. Now, in general, true color, in other words, realistic color, is a 24-bit image. It, it I think it can have about 16 
a million colors, something like that. I haven't done the math lately, but it was something like that along those lines. Now, the difference between a 16-bit image and, a th and, a, and an 8-bit image is fairly... Like, you'd have to look for it, but you'll see differences. But the difference between a 16-bit image and a 32-bit image or a 24-bit image, which is a true color image, would be very difficult to spot indeed because it would require, um, you know, very scrutinous observation and, and, and long staring, essentially, to compare two different images with different bit depths. Okay, so um, now that you understand that each of these channels hold a value, in this case, this would be 255, 255, 255. These things are maxed out. Altogether, they make white okay uh we're gonna have to go into photoshop so we can take a look at what exactly is happening here so i'm gonna dump this open photoshop and i have i have this i've just gotten a couple of pictures here so i'm gonna be using these two i got this off of um, um uh, google basically i googled a picture i literally googled picture and that's what i got so uh you know it's a it's a very nice picture though you know my mind you so whatever Anyway, I'm going to unlock this as background, though it doesn't really matter in this case. Might as well keep it, but whatever. Let's just keep it like it is. So let's go ahead and take a look. Let's go ahead and take a look here. What we've got. we got loads of colors, right? That's, that's very nice and dandy, but how are they presented to us? If we go ahead and take a look at our channels here, you'll quickly see that you've got an RGB channel set. So you got the red, the green, and the, uh, and the blue. For some reason, those are really, really small. Um... What was the way to get these bigger? There we go, large. So as you can see, if we take, if we just turn these off and just set, let's say, only the green channel to be available to us, you'll see that it's a grayscale. Now a grayscale is essentially, uh, well, because one channel, right? You don't have a one color. Well, not one color, but um, okay. So a computer thinks of this in terms of lumina uh, like luminosity. All right, how bright or dark is something? This is your brightness slash darkness type deal. Now, in this channel, this channel corresponds to brightness and darkness of the green color. Okay, so the the darker uh, the green here, the, the less there is. The brighter the green, the more of it there is. Okay, so if we take a look here, you'll see that the green bits over here are much brighter. Uh, okay, I just need to isolate this. Come on, then. Okay, seriously, there was a way to see. I haven't used this in a while as well. Um, I think there was a way to isolate this for sure for with one click just not sure what was uh, the click anyway take a look here you got your greens which is much brighter um, and you've got your darks here okay so the, basically the green bit is this then you've got the red bit which is different as you can see there's much more red on the leaves because the leaves of course are red here right um, Jesus come on was it with alt no uh, I think this works only for layers for some reason in this case. Uh, anyway, take a look at the red bit. There's definitely uh, a lot more red here. Oh, sorry, I'm, I'm in green right now. A lot more red here, right? And then if we take a look at the blue, the blue is the least amount because, well, you know, even though the sky is blue over here, there's really not that much blue on the scene altogether, although there are some spots. But as you can see, the bark is basically black, right? The, the, well, it's dark. There's there's almost no blue on it. Now, as you, as you combine these channels, you'll see, for example, if I combine the blue and the green, I'll get this greenish blue hue, and I will get my uh, almost all of my um, um, sky back, okay? Now, if I do the same, and I turn off the blue, and I just get the red, I'll get this magentish, not magentish, but like orangeyish color, and a lot of my sky will turn green because even though there's a little bit of green in the sky, it will now overtake completely the sky since there is no blue channel coming in at all. And there's loads of green stuff. If I combine both, all of them, I'll get the blue bits coming in from the sky, as you can see here. Oh, this nice blue is over here. Same thing can happen, by the way, if I turn off the green, I'll get the magenta, uh, the purplish. Now, they're not very uh, obvious. This is not a very obvious combination of colors, but it's it's an important bit because without it, you will you know, you'll lose quite a huge amount of your spectrum, okay? So uh, as you can see, there's definitely loads of, um, you know, lo loads of combinations when it comes to your channels. And you could work just with those channels, obviously. You could just say, well, I just want to take the green channel. I just want to take the blue channel. I just want to take the red channel. A and it's, it's fair play to you, right? Uh, so what exactly does that mean? That means that you can, if you start to modify these values here in these channels, let's say I create a levels layer, um, a levels layer, 
if we take a look here, we've got the RGB, the red, green, and blue. So what can I do? Well, let's just say uh, if I grab the red, right? I'm just going to have to make the histogram a little bit better. Uh, and I start scanning my values. Now take a look. I got from 0 to 255, which are my levels, right? This is basically all my range, all my color range here. Now if I say, well, I'll grab this and I say, okay, I want the actual value of red to be black when it's 25. So 25 would be my, my black value. Notice what happened to the image, right? So if I turn this off, you will see that my reds are starting to dim a little because I'm just I just I just completely uh, blew these values up to 25. There's no more, 25 is the new zero. I essentially lowered the spectrum range and the luminosity of my object uh, of my um, uh, picture has therefore decreased, especially in the red spectra uh, in the red uh, channel department. Now I could say the same furthermore and say, well, you know what? My darkest dark will actually be this bright. Now have I completely uh, destroyed the idea of my let's just put put this at 25 now what do you think did I just fix my problem here if I did that if I basically said okay my darkest dark is gonna be this dark and then my uh, my zero in the basically in the luminosity department will be also 25 well if I go ahead and increase this back to zero you will see a difference from before obviously this is much better but I, this essentially brightens all the overall image output. This like kind of boosts it, whereas this just floors it. Okay, so this kind of kills it. This floors it. Okay, uh, I hope it's easy enough to understand. Well, I'm just going to put it to let's say one one fourteen, and you'll see the difference. So if I go to one fifteen on this side, you'll see that I'm kind of just desaturating the image, right? There's not a lot of saturation when it comes to it. And if I go ahead and just put the, the levels back, you see that I'm basically removing the red as I increase my uh, flooring value. And I can do the same, obviously, on both sides. I could say, well, maybe I want to go from this side. I'm just going to boost my red and say that, oh, this is actually what it will, like my new 255 is actually 126. This is like the middle, basically. Obviously, you could do the same for, for the midtones, but uh, uh, you know, midtones are a little bit different. And you got the same, by the way, the same uh, filter here in substance. So, you know, levels is a fairly universal, um, uh, you know, uh, effect, so to speak. So now that you'll see what, what's going to happen with the red, I can do the same to the green. I say, well, you know what? If I go ahead and take a look here at the green bit, and I say, well, I don't know, maybe I just want to darken my greens and there's less green, right? There's, my greens are darker, there's less of them, and I could even reduce their output, uh, sorry, reduce their output on this side and make them even darker. So as you can see, there's plenty of ways to influence the exact same image just by changing these values. And like I said, I'm only working on the specific channel. Now, it's entirely possible to work on all of these channels. However, the effects will be predictable at you know as, as you may already imagine so if I go ahead and just lower the levels I will lower the overall luminosity of the object uh, sorry of the t you know the picture but it will remain so you know it, it will, it'll still have the same balance so I'm kind of like maybe increasing the vibrance of this object uh, Jesus object of this picture and I'm getting a lot of good feedback let's say I maybe I like this and I just export this or in other words save it okay so uh, maybe I could do the opposite, right? I could just grab it from the highest and just drag it down to make it lighter. And if I'm not happy with this, I could drag drag the midtones upwards. So I'd say that the gray point is actually uh, like 0 0.45 is the real gray point. Okay, so I could get something like this, and I could just play with with my output values. So maybe if I want to brighten this, this is not a very good result. Um, but as you can see, there's loads of different ways to manipulate an image just by changing the values of these. Um, you know, the values of these um, uh, channels, right? So uh, <clears throat> how does this work when it comes to the RGB? And what does this have to do with everything else, really? Well, what I wanted to do here is simply show you with the blending modes as well. So first of all, we need to understand something. This is obviously made of pixels. If I zoom over here, I'll get the pixel, the pixel grid, and you will notice that each pixel has its own value. Now this value directly corresponds to this 255 range. So if you can see here, let's say, I don't know, how much do you think this is? This is a fairly dark pixel, right? So I need to be brightening a lot in order to get it. So let's work on the green uh, channel over here. And let's say that I wanna target this particular pixel. I wanna brighten the fucker. 
what am I, what do I have to do? Well, first of all, I need to start uh, whitening all these. Like this one is probably gonna be the first one to go over here. And I will start whitening it. And as you can see, the more I whiten it, the closer these things get to white. Come on, come on, come on. There you go, there you go, there you go. Well, white in terms of the channel, obviously green is, this is the maximum green. Um, so there we go, I'm, I'm almost done, I'm almost done, and there we go, I've, I've just did it, okay? As you can see, I almost completely negated uh, the green here, just blew it up completely almost to the max. And this is the, the this particular, um, this particular uh, pixel was the one that was targeting. As you can see, it took me quite a lot of pixels I had to actually, uh, you know, remove in order for this to happen. And let's take a look at our green. Well, I've completely overloaded everything with green now, didn't I? That's okay, because at the end of the day, we're only increasing the luminosity of the channel. If we go ahead back into our channel and just take a look at, look at what happened to the green, by the way. The green is white. That's why I was saying that you're making it white. If I turn this off, we're gonna have the exact same result as we had before with the magenta and the blue and the red, right? Uh, so this is essentially what happens. I'm simply lightening or darkening a particular color channel. So if I take, if I just turn this one on and just use this one and we go back into our selection, you'll see that this is obviously black. And if I go, well, it's black because I basically dumped it. But if I do the same thing, you will notice that I'm whitening everything, whitening, whitening, whitening. There's only one left, one left, one left. And I will now just now remove it. So this is probably 31 value. Obviously you could pick, use the color picker to get a better value, okay? Um, same thing goes for each channel, by the way. You can do this on each channel and the results will differ depending on which channel you work on. Uh, obviously, there's different, uh, you know, at least in, in, in um, Photoshop, there's different methods of doing that. You could use a histogram, right? There's, there's different, you could just say, well, not levels, I want the curves, uh, which is a much more advanced level of levels. So you could grab the curves and say, well, I just want to start working on a particular set, right? So you've got let's say uh, you want to darken the darks, right? Or just increase this. And obviously this works on a selection. Well, at least in this case, it, it created it with a mask, which uh, I don't want. So I'm just gonna go, go ahead back to my history and just delete that thing. Anyway, that being said, now that you understand that each pixel has its own color value and this color value is, um, well, important that important to the overall composition of the picture. There's also other methods you can um, manipulate a picture. Uh, I'm just talking about the ones that we will be able to use in Painter because obviously it's not as granular. You're not going to be going to your pixels and be like, oh, I'm just going to change this pixel. Now, this is Photoshop is great for photos, right? Uh, but there's definitely something to be said here about their blending modes. Now, in order to blend something, we need to actually have it as a picture. And that's exactly what I'm going to do. I'm going to grab this overlay. I'm going to just drop it over here. And I'm going to say, okay, not over here, but uh, I should have dropped it over here. My bad in the viewport there it is so this is my new layer set <clears throat> i'm just going to leave this as it is now obviously because of uh, uh because uh, of the way uh, photoshop works uh you know i won't be able to uh, affect this rgb color okay now i don't know if i should or should not move this up so i can affect it as well actually let me just turn this on uh turn this off and i'm going to just add another another one of these levels uh over here and if I, I can do the same, notice that by the way, my colors are completely blown up, all right? I got a little bit in the middle and I got all of this, all, all of the rest on the other side. So if, if I keep doing so, there's no color basically here for me to work with. Everything is maxed out as it is. So there's nothing I can do. They're, they are all at maximum value. The worst I could do probably is just reduce the output. Uh, like this, for example, I could say, well, I wanna reduce the output or increase the output, but generally I'm not gonna get uh, much of a result. Let's say even if I grab the red and we take a look at the channel here, notice the channels look fairly uh, unique when it comes to, um, this is just the green, right? And notice that the green, by the way, is white. So this is white, so there, there is green here. And if I, if I turn on the blue, there will also be blue here and this will be magenta. And if I go ahead and turn on the red, this will be yellow over here. Now, if I combine the two, I will get the white. So that's why you have to understand that all these things kind of work together when it comes to, I'm just gonna turn this off, uh, when it comes to these um, uh, you know, methods. Uh, so if I go ahead and just turn this on again, notice by the way that I will be able to now manipulate both of these together. Okay, so if I start reducing the, 
uh, increasing the output level of my darks, I will in, you know, influence not only the uh, lower image, but also the upper. So I don't want that. And therefore, I will simply delete this, uh, this layer here. Okay. Now, what are blend modes? Well, a blend mode is essentially a method of combining two images. And there's a couple of them uh, you know, all together. Now, first and foremost, you will notice that this has a transparency layer. If we take a look here, this is a transparency layer. It's completely, it doesn't have any opacity, all right? So anything that goes through, anything that is behind it will be going through. That's, for, that's why we actually see the back of it. If I go ahead and import the other one, the, the one with the white background, this will actually overtake the image. Now, the reason I did this is because I really want to, um, you know, show you and showcase how blend modes work. Let's go ahead and first start with the most simple way to blend things, and that is to uh, see how transparent a layer is. So the more opacity I add, okay, the higher the opacity, the more I see from the image that I'm adjusting for right now. And that is all fine and dandy. Obviously, there's nothing you can do about it. Obviously, you could do some fills, uh, which is uh, the same thing, but only... Um, well, it's just, it's just for, for the color, right? Not just the overall image. Uh, but there's one more thing, and that is the different blending methods. Now, in this case, let's just use the dissolve. The, remember, the normal bit is the one that we had before. Now, dissolve didn't do much because, well, only, it did something, but it's it's over here, for example, where the, um, where the uh, you know, the pixels are. Essentially, what dissolve does is um, it basically takes random pixels and spreads them around and basically combines them with the image at the back. Now, since this is a fairly uniform image, there's really not much to do. So dissolve is not a very, not a very good example for this. But let's go for darken. Now, for darken, we get a much more different result. You will notice that um, a darken, well, basically, this is a method of uh, multiplying, well, not multiplying, but uh, I, I believe it was multiplying uh, the background and the foreground colors together, sort of. So as you can see, the results are much more different. The green gets multiplied with green, we get green, uh, but the blue and the yellow, like the white, for example, only brightens the image. Actually, I think it does nothing. Well, I should turn this off. Yes, the white does not does nothing in this particular sense. So as you can see, there is a difference in terms of like the reds are darkening the red, the greens are darkening the greens and the blue is trying to darken something, but there is basically no blue here. Okay. Uh, after that, of course, you've got the multiply and this multiplies basically multiplies together. So the darken uh, combines them. So I, I believe it just adds them together. Multiply obviously takes the values of these pixels that we were talking about and just multiplies them together. So you, you take the green pixel over here and multiply by the green pixel of this image with green pixel of the background. Uh, all right, so there's really not much difference as you can see between multiply and darken. They're pretty much identical. All right, I'm just I'm changing them right now as you can see here. I'm changing them, and the only thing that difference differs is the uh, the girth of this picture of this uh, letter over here, and obviously all of these are the others. So multiply is uh, basically a mode of darkening. All these modes basically do the same thing, but just in in, in different ways. For example, uh, uh, color burn just is a little, a little bit more extreme when it comes to um, uh, the darkening. Essentially, uh, there's diff these are different functions. You can obviously find them all on, on the wiki. I generally tend not to bother myself with what one does. I just take a look at what each one does and just um, you know uh, get a, get see the result that if I like it. Obviously, that is only if I need to darken or, or uh, lighten something. Um, again, if you really have a deep understanding how these things work, you can really work towards something amazing. If, you, if you're that kind of person, obviously you can create an image that is only specifically designed for, let's say, linear burn. And this would burn this, you know, this color type deal onto your uh, background just the right way that you wanted it. When, that's completely fine. However, in most, in most cases, you can just add a mask, you know, burn whatever it is you like, add a mask and get the results. Um, the darken color is also pretty cool. Oh, sorry, the darker color in this case is a, this is a, um, this basically takes a darker color of the two uh, layers. And um, uh, what's his face? Uh, you know, uh, I forget the name now. Okay, basically the darker color wins. All right, just think of it this way. In this case, the red wins because it's darker than this bit, but then this bit is darker than this red. So it's like 
whoever whoever wins as you can see these are darker than this green so they win most of the time but this green is darker than this part so it wins here right um so you've got the same thing these are basically all your darkened options these are all here dark and multiply color brown linear brown dark and color darker color are essentially the same the same uh, they do the same function they darken your image or you know add color to it but you you know doing using the dark side of the force now lighten is the opposite lighten screen color dodge linear dodge and lighter color they're all um doing the exact same thing but the opposite obviously lighter adds the luminosity of your objects um sorry of your uh picture to the background uh screen does the same thing as multiply but in the inverse so it's like screen inverts the values of these pixels so 255 would be minus 255 um well sorry zero in this case not minus but it basically it inverts them multiplies them then inverts them again so it basically this makes it into a brighter color uh obviously you got color dodge which does the same thing as the as is the opposite of the uh, color burn which adds uh basically i think it was some kind of weird formula i forgot now at this point uh, you've got the linear dodge, which is just without the uh, the color. I think it's just the luminosity of, of the overall output. Then you've got the lighter color, which is basically the lighter color wins in this case, just like the darker color won last time. In this case, this dark, uh, the lighter color wins in this overlay. Uh, after that, you've got the actual overlay, which is actually a pretty cool uh, function. Now, overlay multiple, uh, combines the multiply and the screen, which essentially means that I, I use it a lot because it's a, it's a pretty cool setup basically uh you get the darker the, you, you, like the darker bits become darker and the brighter bits become darker plus the color that you add through the image okay which is pretty cool uh by the way all of these others they're essentially combinations of functions that operate based on these four so let's say overlay would be lighten and darken at the same time soft light would be like screen and multiply at the same time uh, sorry, my bad. Overlay would be screen and multiply at the same time. Uh, soft light would be probably darken and lighten. Uh, hard light would be a color dodge and color burn. Vivid light would be, I don't know, linear dodge. Like basically they combine together, right? And as you can see, the results are somehow good, some, sometimes good, sometimes not. As you can see, you got the soft light doing something. Uh, the hard light essentially is just almost non-existent. I mean, it does something. I believe it just uh, adds the colors together. Vivid light does this, does something amazing as well. I just I don't I don't know what it does in this case. Uh, it's been a while since I've used these, but I just wanted you to see that there's a difference in the blending modes are useful in such a way. I, I never really did learn all of them in terms of usage because most of them, uh, most of the time, you, most of the time you'll just be using multiply screen light and darken, you know, color dodge, maybe overlay and soft light. Uh, you know, rarely you'd go further down the list. Linear light. Oh, actually, linear light is useful. It actually uh, brightens the image, just uses the uh, brightness of the uh, higher image of the foreground and, uh, you know, dumps it down into the background. But this, since this is maxed out, there's really not much of a result. Uh, then you got the pin light. Really, I should have used a better image. Let's go for hard mix. This, I don't know what this does. You got the difference, which is, uh, you know, unsurprisingly, the... Uh, negative of the image and then it does some stupid shit like that then you got the exclusion which you also uses that the uh, subtract which is the combination of these basically the further down this list you go the more combinations you get so that these four would be the you know the the bits here obviously subtract doesn't do much because subtract basically takes the luminosity color uh, the luminosity value of the pixels and the background and you know removes it from the foreground so in this case if i uh if you see here you've got white <clears throat> So this is whatever color this is. Let's say this is 15, 255. No, not 250. Let's say this is uh, 109, okay? I don't think there was a way. I think there was a way to get to see the color here. Where's my eyedropper? Uh, okay, not not like that. Uh, eyedropper. Was that not the eyedropper? Okay, what is... Oh, I already was in the eyedropper mode. So if we take a look here, my value is... Oh, I don't know. It doesn't say here. Quite annoying. What is that? Does it say... I'm currently at 180 red, 194 green, and uh, 59 blue. Or you could just use you know whatever whatever here you want to see. This is the CM CMYK here, also hue, saturation, and brightness. Uh, you know whichever way you want to work. I I prefer hue, saturation, and brightness. But then again, to each zone. Anyway, the point is that this has a particular color, 
and obviously if I decide to add this here this this color will be down to zero because this was white okay and uh, obviously the divide does the same thing but it just divides the the two you know the values of the two pixels together uh, so the foreground and the background gets divided then you got the hue which is just the color bit so you just uh, you're only transferring the chroma so to speak onto the background or to the foreground uh, so in this case since white is no color it just bleeds directly in the, um, the yellow you can pretty much see what's happening here right hopefully so take a look here we've got a little color actually this looks pretty cool I'd say uh, and then you've got what else we've got you got saturation which simply saturates and the color which just simply takes the color nothing else so all these are combinations of different blend modes. They're all available. Uh, yeah, luminosity also. This is simply the luminosity from the channels here. Uh, but yeah, uh, as you can see, this is uh, only this is a lot of stuff to uh, take in. However, you have to understand that all these are available and a little a few more when it comes to normal maps. It's that are available in Painter. Um, so as you can see, there is quite a lot of stuff when it comes to blending modes. Not to mention that once you combine this with opacity, you can do some pretty cool things. Like let's say you could multiply this, right? but you're not happy with the particular result, or maybe you could say, uh, well, I wanna overlay this. I like overlay in general. So you could say the opacity, well, this is kind of meh. So I'm gonna drop the opacity down a little bit and I could grab the fill as well on this thing, to not have it as saturated as much. So you could have something like this. This is a very subtle effect, obviously. Although, well, obviously subtle effect, but if I had a picture, I might actually get away with this and I could just drop the opacity even more in this case. Something like this very invisible so to speak obviously i could pump this up i'll just lower this again so you could have something like this now this is obviously not a perfect image but if we if, as you can see there is a difference here right so you, you can definitely work with whatever you've got and it all depends on how you want to present your 2d content uh, and how you want to actually apply it to your 3d meshes now, obviously you won't be applying a picture like that to 3d mesh because this will defeat the purpose of having a 3d mesh in the first place uh, but there's definitely um, there's definitely a certain amount of merit to knowing what kind of images uh, you know what how they work etc etc so I'm just gonna close this right now since I want to work I want to go over the other set of uh, items on our agenda here and they and these are the maps now all of these maps maybe I should go this and do this in a separate video oh uh, I don't know I'll let, fuck it, let's go through this one. We might as well just finish the whole texture bit here. So let's start with the albedo map. This is the base color, the basic color, most basic color in your map. Now the reason, uh, I'm gonna talk about the albedo a little bit more in the next video when we go over PBR rendering and how exactly the PBR bit works so that you understand how the whole idea is. But essentially the albedo map is your base color. This is the color, like this is the base, the base color of your, the underlying color of your material, right? The, bo the bottom most bit of your layer stack, so to speak. So if this was a layer stack, this would be at the most bottom bit, okay? Uh, now, as you can see, I could even grab this, let's say, and put it onto, well, I can put it onto uh, here, right? Uh, unlock this. So as you can see here, right, you've got, uh, you basically got rid of, you desaturated the image, you got rid of all of these, highlights and shadows and that's important because highlights and shadows will be recalculated and re-added according to um, you know the physics and the lighting engine which provides the PBR obviously is a very realistic rendering engine uh, not engine but a method of rendering uh, so as you can imagine you don't want to have realistic things coming to you from the outside so you want to be calculating your shadows and highlights you don't want to be adding them manually so you want to have a clean sample when it comes to your color. So you only want the base color, right? What color is this brick? If we remove all the all, all the dirt, if we get rid of all the light, if there's no shadows, right? This and that. So this would be the color of the brick. Uh, therefore, you want whenever you're doing your albedos, there's obviously specific, uh, you know, a particular set of uh, instructions when it comes to physically based rendering. Because unlike in real life, we could go to the extremes and have something which is completely fully maximum black or white which, you know, in reality, it doesn't happen. There's no such thing as the completely black or completely white things, okay, with the possible exception, exception of black holes, but even they, you know, have some output, right? They're not completely 
it, like they don't they, they they exist at the very least so they do have an output anyway i'm getting too scientific here and just uh, getting off topic what i'm trying to say is that the albedo map is the color that you will be feeding into the rest of your um object okay not uh, not object but your uh, uh map stack so to speak okay now how do you get these uh crevices and creases etc etc well in order to understand this we have to first understand uh how many channels we've got here in this case we've got eight channel sorry three channels eight bit each so as you can see we have a colored image however that's not always the case you see in computer graphics there's loads of interesting ways of um loads of inter interesting waves of essentially uh encoding data into the pixels here um how should well not encoding only but also interpreting so if you have this as a carrier of a particular set of data as long as you can decode it correctly uh you will get a desired result now in this case by the way you could even look at this uh color as a vector because you've got several you got three variables which is red green and blue and they essentially form a vector which would be a vector three in other words with three uh, with three variables obviously you could have a four dimensional sorry a, a vector four which would have an alpha channel or transparency etc now if you take a look here obviously we've got all of these four channels and they are in grayscale obviously when combined they form a color well color a color <laughs> sorry guys i'm starting to get a dry mouth again it's ridiculous uh but the more important thing is here if we take a look at the re at the next bit and say let's grab a bump map where is the bump map i believe i did download a bump map okay a, hi a height map is the same thing uh so a height map here in this case it creates it creates a this is basically a uh, green a, a, um, a grayscale image as you can see here the images are almost exactly the same you've got this well they're not exactly the same but as you can see it's, it's grayscale okay it just adds the uh, color mix that you expect to get as you were opening as we were just seeing in the previous image with the uh, rgb uh, circles here so as you can see here it is a fully identical grayscale and there really is no difference between these images so the full object sorry the full uh, composition here is just one it's mono now what can we get out of this well if we were to say let's just say we have a blank canvas and we open it into 3d and say well i don't know maybe what if we decided to um tell the computer right that the darker colors right from zero to two to two so from zero to 255 jesus christ i need some water man uh from zero to 255 um you know represent a particular height okay so a mountain would be completely white and an abyss would be completely black so depending on the uh, distribution of pixels here in terms of their values you could actually paint a terrain right you could paint a terrain which is really amazing you could just tell the computer look dude whenever there's white the, the whiter the color is the higher something is or a, a hill would be something so you start with the completely gray which would be your flat 128 uh so 128 would be your your your, your zero point this would be your a sea level type of deal and after that you've got uh you know minus 128 which would be zero essentially and plus 120 which would be 255 uh so that's that's basically how you'd be approaching this and this is how you'd be using the height map uh you know to create terrain now the bump map is exactly the same thing a height map and a bump map there's no difference between them uh they essentially they, they well actually there is there is there is there is my bad uh, a bump map is uh read differently i mean they're all the same in terms of their output they're all sorry input they're all um a grayscale right but the outputs are different depending on how they're being read you could obviously use this as a height map and also as a bump map this could be a map of io as denoted by the name here made it by Kessig. I, I don't know uh point is that this could be a height map of io which is a moon of saturn i believe or no it's a jupiter moon my bad uh so uh you could just recreate io in the engine right now and by the way unreal engine 4 works with height maps so you could just grab this import this into a ue4 and this would create the landscape of the io moon actually really fast by the way it'll take you about half an hour to get this done if you uh if you're slow if you're fast you could be five, five maybe ten minutes and obviously depending on how big the terrain you're generating is uh the point is and obviously how uh, you know how good of a resolution this is and obviously this is not 
a very good resolution. If I get, if I could just zoom here, yeah, this is the, the resolution is pretty shit. Notice by the way that we're working at RGB slash eight here, meaning that we've got 256 values per uh, channel. Okay, so there's eight bits per channel, or AKA a byte. <clears throat> okay, moving on. Now, since this is a height map and we've got a bump map, what we want to do is see this is there's the bump map. So this is the bump map. Now, bump map is like I said again a grayscale. And in this case, it simply gen it, it creates the illusion of detail. Okay. Now, unlike a height map, which can be red, it's basically a height map is red as a, a bump map is red as a height map when it generates, uh, when it creates a particular um, a geometry. Okay. A height map can create geometry. Now, a bump map is there not to create geometry. It's only there to fool you into believing that there is depth. In this case, obviously, like like before, we've got the whiter bits, which are higher. The the lower, the darker bits are basically uh, more, uh, you know, concave, so to speak. So inwards, okay. Uh, this, however, the the problem with the bump map is that it does not actually, um, like, it doesn't actually calculate. It doesn't help you calculate lighting, okay. So if you got a bump map and something is bumping out, let's say, you know, if we take, if we just use the brick wall as an example, oh, there we go. So it works only on these guys. Let me just make them large so it's easier for you guys to see. So in this case, well, a bump map could create this uh, illusion, okay? However, it would not be giving us these highlights and uh, shadows because the rendering engine wouldn't know that there was something there for light to actually interfere, sorry, interact with this surface. Therefore, bump maps are usually uh, kept for, uh, you know, lame things like, like gravel, okay? You would use the gravel here, right? So uh, that's why you would want your bump map to be um, only for things such as the ground, for example, or uh, something that does not require light calculation because obviously very rarely you'll have to have your, you know, players actually looking at the ground and having, you know, things bounce. But obviously bump maps are kind of, um, uh, you know, getting out of favor. However, there's one significant advantage to bump maps versus normal maps, and that's the fact that they're low in size. Although in this day and age, you know, memory is galore. There's loads of memory available, as, you know, both physical and random. Uh, so your RAMs are huge, and your 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 uh, your storage units are getting bigger and bigger. So bump bump maps are essentially are getting out of favor. Uh, but the cool thing is that bump maps can, and most of the cases are either derived or create normal maps so you can easily transform you can easily convert one map to another in fact almost everything comes out of a normal map. you can get a normal map you can get everything you can turn everything into an, uh, into anything else in fact you can you can get this and say all right i want to be this i want this to be a normal map and it will it will turn into a normal map you can't convert these to you know around so uh, it's only for the final use that you need that okay Anyway, that being said, let's move on. Let's. The next one is the displacement map. Now, uh, the displacement map is a little bit different than the bump map. It's still a grayscale. However, it also changes the geometry, the physical geometry of the vertices, their position. That's why they call. That's why this is called a displacement map. In other words, um, if you had something. In fact, let me just show you how this works over here. So as you can, as you can see, our base mesh has some basic detail on the sides over here. We got some stuff. And our displacement map actually adds a lot of detail, like the pores, like these little uh, uh, blemishes, the spots, I don't know what they're called, right? Um, a lot of detail is being added by a displacement map. Now, obviously, this is a very well-done displacement map, and it's very, very well applied. However, you have to understand that it, it will be heavy enough for your, um, um, how should I say, uh, like... You, it's very, it's very unlikely that you will use this in a game, okay? Because in this case, notice that because the displacement map changes the position of vertices, you actually need to have that many vertices to generate <clears throat> that much of a detail, okay? This is a huge amount of detail, so you need that many vertices. And in this case, we've got a lot of uh, pixels as well to denominate, uh, you know, to represent the quality of this picture. Um, Windows won't let me zoom into the pixel grid, unfortunately. Uh, why are you not letting me zoom? Oh, this is the maximum you can zoom to? This is just sad, man. Anyway, um, I, I hope the difference is clear. So uh, displacement map is a very valuable tool when you're modeling. When you're creating something with a high poly model, you want to actually 
add a lot of details so this could be baked into a normal map or you could just generate this detail into the normal map automatically by just converting it on all right now there's other other types of displacement maps and there is all these are known as vector displacement maps and these look like this the difference between a vector displacement map obviously this is this is a vector displacement map and this is a displacement map is that first of all the vector displacement is a three color a th th sorry sorry three channel uh, uh, image okay uh, this means that it can encode a lot more information remember we're encoding information in order to in order for it to be read so the difference between a vector displacement map and a displacement map is the fact that you can actually store data behind an object okay so you can have an ear and this ear could be then um, recreated with all of its detail behind the ear so if we take if you remember uv mapping i'm, I'm, I'm projecting a camera I have a camera projection I'm creating this UV shell you will obviously remember hopefully you remember that the shell is um, overlapping it has a back and a front okay I need to I need to cut it and unfold it uh, in this case over here we can we're doing the same thing with the bump map sorry the displacement map in this case because the displacement map can only show us what you know what's the what's the flat value there's only from 0 to 55 so this is a it's either raised or lowered but it cannot be uh, folded into itself right or bent into itself or concave into such a way that something behind the ear especially for example if you got a very complex shape in the ear in this case with the vector displacement map you can actually do that uh, and this is a very this is a very powerful tool indeed a lot a lot of people use it in uh, in sculpting so you could have let's say a spike or some kind of uh, or scars or like anything basically that like spikes in general look anything that you can think of you can flatten into a vector displacement map and just stamp it on as a shape as a high poly shape so it's a very powerful tool however most likely you will not be using this in game development or well, no 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 in uh the final game product you will most likely be using this in game development because you'll be needing assets and high poly assets um require a lot of work and vector displacement maps save a lot of that work so if you were to make a dinosaur and it would have a spine back you wouldn't have to make you know uh, spines by hand all you got to do is just make one spine and and just keep and just place it so that's 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 how it's done uh, after that you've got the parallax uh, the parallax um, um, basically map mapping um, which is a little bit more well we should go over the normal first by the way let's go over the normal uh, here as you can see we've got actually I should probably import this thing as you can see here we've got all the different channels so let's go ahead and take a look you've got the the green uh, sorry the blue right then you've got the uh, green right and then you've got the red right so you've got you've got different channels here and obviously the the blue is the predominant one reason being is that as far as I remember I'm not entirely sure don't quote me on that you have you're gonna have to do some research if I'm wrong but if I remember correctly blue was your neutral ground so to speak blue is your flat plane so instead of being grayscale this is obviously three channels so you can encode a lot more data including lighting data so lighting can be calculated off off a normal map that's why it's more powerful uh, and by the way it's also can be can be gotten from a bump map uh, but yeah blue is your neutral which is 128 then you've got your green which i think is the actual index inward so your green is going is basically your depth and the red is your height okay so as you can see here your height is the side this is what red gives me this is what green gives me and obviously blue gives me the whole uh, just the flat you know the flat planes um I might be wrong though I'm not don't quote me on that I'm not entirely sure if that was if they had to do something with the highlights as well because yeah yeah but by the way the, that's what that's why you see normal maps with such color because they're being encoded into okay notice that there's some damage here let's take a look let's try to crack this okay that's not it okay that's not it okay that's not it right altogether they do create a fairly interesting combination here anyway uh, let's go back into our uh, setup here now in order to just show you how powerful a normal map is I just want to show you this I got this off uh, the Wikipedia page so uh, you can check it out yourself but as you can see a 4 million mesh a, sh a mesh with 4 million triangles which is in roughly a million polygons 
um, well, not four million, not, not a million polygons, two million polygons, so to speak. Uh, but what I wanted to say is that um, you can see here the topology of this new object, which is only 500 triangles. Now, this is a vastly simplified mesh. However, using a normal map, you get almost the exact same result. Now, obviously, you're not going to get the same result. Obviously not. Uh, it would be you know, insanity to think that you get the exact same results. However, notice the differences. There is a lot of there's a lot of similarities, right? A player, and by the way, the, 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 you know, the load on your system is ridiculously huge when it comes to 4 million triangles. You have to render this all the time, moving, animating, etc., etc. Whereas a normal map takes only a couple of kilobytes, maybe a megabyte, maybe even if it takes 10 megabytes of your RAM, right? The results are worth it because you get such good detail for basically nothing. It's free, right? So you should definitely use it. L look at what you would be getting otherwise. You see this? This is this is how it looks like. This is what the geometry, the geometric shape of the object actually looks like. And when you apply the normal map, in other words, something that's been baked on. So you bake this. This is the original mesh. You bake this onto the simplified mesh, right? You get the normal map, which is a 2D pixel based image. You apply this image onto the UVs, and these because you, these UVs correspond with all the vertices on this object they can actually be corresponding to the image and that's why you can put the the normal map on top of your image and you sorry uh on top of your uvs and therefore wrapping it around your object and you will get this result as you can see it's not ideal right you could get a you know uh, it's not exactly a hundred percent match but it's damn close so normal maps are definitely worth your time uh you know making them now there's another fancy way of doing the uh, of making something is actually using a, a parallax map now, a parallax map is somehow is somewhat um, kind of like a uh, how should I say it? like a, a normal map on steroids. Put it this way. Now, a normal map obviously does not displace uh, your uh, materials, not materials, but um, does not displace your uh, vertices. And the pa a parallax map does the same as well. As far as I remember, parallax mapping did not change the vertices actually no it did it didn't it doesn't change the vertices the parallax, parallax map does not do that i'm not sure how exactly is this image achieved but i think it was there's some fancy math behind it but you can definitely see the difference right this is your regular texture which simply looks like a flat set of whatever right a normal map will help with some light calculation it will add some depth a parallax map will kind of added, but I don't know what this, you know, I have no idea what the steep parallax mapping is, but it looks really good, right? So you're basically getting geometry out of nothing. And I can guarantee you that this is not an actual shape, right? This is not part of the mesh. This is just the way it looks, as in this is, this is just how it renders. And if you don't believe me, here's an example of Mass Effect stairs. These stairs over here, these stairs over here are a flat plane. This is a flat plane. There are no stairs here. This is a flat plane, guys. The reason you see these stairs is because this is a parallax map. All right? This is an illusion. This is not... Well, it's, it's not an illusion, but what I'm saying is that this is essentially... It's like a ramp. This is a ramp, okay? There are no stairs here in a 3D shape, right? The 3D model was not with 3D with stairs. However... I don't know who had this idea, but I mean, you know, it's not like they saved a lot of... Maybe they did. Maybe they did. I don't know. It depends on, depends on what they had to do. I mean, consoles, uh, they have to do something. And that was a pretty... That was back in, day, in the day. So I don't know. Maybe they were desperate. They really needed to save, you know, a couple of a couple of megabytes of RAM. But this is very... This is amazing, right? They, they just completely fool everyone that these stairs exist. Yet, in fact, it's just an optical illusion. Well, not an optical illusion. It is an illusion but it's achieved in some in a brilliant fashion okay uh so uh, yeah a parallax mapping is cool if you really want to dive into it i you know just go ahead and check it out but since we're independent developers chances are we're not going to be doing such a high budget not high budget but um expensive in terms of performance project that we would need to save like to cut corners and just you know do everything in our power just so that we can optimize the game with parallax mapping um which i think these maps actually have to be made uh, th by baking something out. I don't know how these maps are made. I have, I have no idea. But um, I mean, it's a cool concept, but I really don't think a lot of people will be using it, especially independent developers. 
Um, okay, what else we've got? We've got our normals. We've got, oh yeah, a light map. Well, a light map is fairly obvious. A light map is essentially a grayscale like here, as you can see. Um, and it, it allows you uh, to get the light through. So, I mean, this is, a, this is a, like, there's not much to say here. A light map basically is like a transparency map for your color, for your diffuse, for your albedo. So if this is a brick wall, obviously, like it, like it is in this case, uh, the light map will basically define how much of that luminosity will go through it, and this will be the result. Okay, so very fairly simple. Uh, then you got an emissive color, which is pretty cool. So essentially, an emissive color is also a grayscale, generally. Um, in this case, obviously, it's a black and white, so it's, it's an alpha, so to speak. And, um, well, I mean, what else can you ask, right? You've got your color, you've got your... Uh, little uh, uh, you know uh, emissive map and uh, your color is fed through your emissive map and that's what you get so your emissive map is essentially a uh, uh, you know a no like a zero and one game right white is transparent and black is non-transparent so uh, you know this is the stuff that glows and this is the stuff that doesn't glow there's not really that much um, like there's not that much uh, philosophy going into it okay uh, that's, that's the emissive map uh, done. After that, you've got the curvature map. Now, the curvature map is much much like the bump map, etc., is also a um, uh, grayscale. However, it has a different uh, different objective than the bump map. Reason being, I'm just going to isolate this guy. Reason being is that this essentially shows you uh, the uh, kind of like the edges and the indents of a particular shape. So as you can see here, the white stuff is the raised, like the sharper bits, as in the raised bits, and the black stuff are the more uh, concave bits, like stuff that is more uh, inwards pressed. So like bevels, for example, in a mesh would be almost certainly be present here, right? So if you had a mesh, if this was a mesh, and these were the UVs of a mesh, and you would bake a curvature map, you will get, you know, this curvature map where, where uh, gray, flat 128 gray would be your uh, uh, would be your uh, zero and then you have white which would be the highest and black which would be the lowest and obviously this will allow you to uh, it will allow you to do some pretty cool things because it basically helps you calculate uh, the ambient occlusion uh, so not the ambient occlusion but light it helps you calculate light I'm not sure if it helps with the ambient occlusion I think you don't need it maybe you do need it I don't know ambient occlusion is pretty cool by the way I think you do need it for AO uh, but yeah, as you can see, it's a grayscale as well. Obviously, this can be used as a bump map. It can also be used as a even a, an emissive map. You can you can you know emissive. Uh, however, in order to use this for as an emissive map, you might have to run a levels through it, right? You just have to, oops, you you, you just have to go for uh, something like this, right? And just move the midtones out so that and just maybe even flatten them. Yeah, I just keep this at one. Right, and this would be you just find where your emissive is. So you want this to glow, so this would glow, right? So only this would glow, and obviously you'd play around with your thresholds here, so you can get the right result and see how well they glow. And then obviously you could brighten these out as well. And you get something like this. So you you know you could get you could convert if you really so desire. You could convert a curvature map into an emissive map, then dump this map into. Uh, you know the Unreal Engine, and you'll you'll get it to glow. Obviously, this is not an ideal conversion, and obviously, um, uh, Substance Painter can do a much better job than you just you know poking here by hand, just hoping to grab something, right? Um, there we go. I just completely removed the mid the midtones, I believe. <laughs> yeah. So as you can see, there are no midtones in this case. Probably should say zero, uh, like this. Okay, it has to be zero one. Okay, never mind. The point is, you can play around with a curvature map and get a lot of stuff. Obviously, Substance does that online on the fly for you as you know as you go. Uh, I'm just going to delete this here because it's pointless, and we can go on to our next map, which is the AO, which is the ambient occlusion. Now, the ambient occlusion is exactly the map that we will most likely be using all the time. So, as you can see here, there's a clear example of how th something looks with and without an ambient occlusion. Uh, by the way, AO is calculated much like normal mass when, it, when you're baking something into it. So it will basically cast some rays. It will do some ray tracing, see where light falls into these crevices. And obviously, as you can see, it's a grayscale. So, you know, dark would be something that is you know, black. The darker bits would be the crevice bits uh, where there's shadows. 
and um, um, what's its face? Uh, the wider bits are essentially there. Are, there are no shadows, and then the 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 highest light bits are essentially um, your highlights. Okay, so uh, gray is uh, nothing. A uh, dark black is shadows, and like obviously it's self-explanatory. Hopefully, it's self-explanatory to you guys. All right. Um, so yeah, as you can see, there's definitely uh, there's definitely a use for it because it helps a lot with atmosphere. Uh, that's why it's called ambient occlusion, by the way, because it's not like a you know, it's not in your face occlusion, but it helps a lot with the results. And after that, you've got the cube map, or aka the 360 map, or equi, uh, equi, equi rectangular map. Actually, no, before we finish with this, I want to finish with the cube map. Uh, I just wanted to show you that the, the use of a light map, as you can see, is, uh, you know, it's quite an upgrade over a uh, brick wall. And, you know, props to whoever managed to dump all of this stuff right from this uh, pagoda here uh, into this one map was this one light map that's amazing that's really amazing uh, by the way light maps can also be not only um, you know not only uh, define how light behaves but they can also add light as far as I remember you can use a light map to uh, to bake the light into a map okay so um, yeah usually although I think that's a computer generated like a computer did that I think that a computer baked this in because if someone did this by hand, I'd be fucking, I'd be really impressed. Uh, okay, the next thing we've got is a cube map, and that is something that looks like this. And the reason we use cubes and not spheres, by the way, is because with spheres, you, it, it's very difficult to render spheres. All right, generally speaking, uh, it is a cube map. Uh, in other words, you like. The computer can only render, uh, you know, flat planes. Even the spheres in Maya are essentially a combination of loads of polygons. Uh, so the more polygons you have, the more expensive it is, and you're gonna get distortions. That's why, in general, people are using cube maps because, well, you're not gonna get as much distortion on them, and it's easy enough to render. Obviously, as you're standing from the center of the cube map, if you really find, you could find the seams when you close this box here. You can find the points where uh, these two connect. Um, and you could say, well, yeah, it's possible. However, not likely because um, you could always always do this. Uh, what is it? You could always do this. Okay, and there you go. You've got no seams. It's basically an arithmetic, sorry, uh, like a, like a trigonometric function, so to speak, uh, where you just rotate a bunch of images around, uh, rotate them in a particular fashion, clockwise, counterclockwise, squish them up and down, and you can get a 360 panorama. Obviously, there's a tool set, by the way, online where you could do this uh, easily. You could just go ahead and um, you know pop in and give them something like a panorama that can turn it into a cube map and vice versa for free. Uh, so yeah, basically this this is an environment an environmental map, the cube map and the panorama, and they exist solely for the purpose of uh, immersing the player, such as skyboxes, right, etc., uh, or reflections as well. So if if, the, if you wanted to add this box here as a reflection set. You could use that uh, indefinitely. In fact, it could, we could even open Painter right now and add this as an environment map. Uh, and we probably will do this in a second. I just wanted to finish with the all the maps that we'll be using here in Painter. So you've got your original, which is, let's say you take a picture of something. Obviously, this is what they do. This is the example for bitmap to material where they allow you to take a picture of something and then out of that, the software will extract everything that you need to essentially not bother with designer. Very powerful piece of software, extremely powerful, I have to say. Just get a picture and you can do you can transfer the same thing in the game as long as you have the picture of it. Just brilliant. Okay? Obviously you can't you can't create something that doesn't exist or you can't like if if it doesn't exist you need to, like a spaceship, right? You you need to make the <laughs> you can't take a picture of a spaceship, okay? Uh, although definitely you could just you know, take the material out of it and just get it done. Uh, the point is, right, that um, what you want here, okay, is a base color, which is without all the highlights. If we take a look over here, there are no highlights, right? No highlights, no shadows in the base color. There's a little bit, but very little over here. And this is just rust, I believe, rust and dirt. There's no shadows, really. Uh, obviously, you've got your normal after that and your roughness, which is, uh, we're going to talk about roughness later, and metallic. Basically, these are grayscale maps, which... Uh, you know, PBR works in such a way, and obviously AO, your ambient occlusion. 
So most of, these are these are the four basic maps that you'll be using in almost every single every time you you have something open in Painter, you will be having these five maps. Okay, your base color, your normal, your roughness, your metallic, your ambient occlusion. You'll probably be having more, such as the emissive, right? You could even have a displacement, a bump, or height even, uh, right? Whatever floats your boat. But the roughness and metallic is a very simple concept. Uh, metallic is essentially a map that shows you how so how reflective is something. Uh, so uh, let's say if something is fully reflective, it will be like a mirror. If something is not reflective at all, at all, it will be like it will be like plastic. My right? plastic is not reflective at all. A mirror is fully reflective, and a mirror is made of metal. So you know. Uh, but what I wanted to say here is the fact that it's also a grayscale, and you know you could do a lot with it as well. Uh, after that, roughness obviously is the opposite. Uh, well, not the opposite, but it basically is like a microsurface um, detailing bit. Uh, look, roughness is basically like how rough the surface is. I know, I mean, it's mind blowing, but yeah, the roughness map, you know, defines the roughness of the surface. And the rougher the surface is, the the more the more it spreads out the light. It could be metallic, but it could be a really rough metal. Uh, meaning that the light will not be reflective at 100%, but it'll be like, you know, splashed on top of it and have huge highlights instead of just something very sharp and very shiny. Okay, you're gonna have this big, huge blob of light, so to speak. And you can even look, you can even see it over here, as you can see, there's a little bit of, like you can get some sheen here, but in general, there's really not that much, there's no highlights here at all almost, okay? Almost all of the light is basically splashed on top of this thing. But damn, this is an ugly picture, man. <laughs> it's fucking, I don't even know what this is, a manhole? I don't know, it's ugly as hell, though. Anyway, that being said, guys, that is all. Actually, let's go ahead and open Painter so that I show you exactly what I mean by the panorama. I believe it'll allow me to do that, hopefully. Um, 360 map here. Let me just start painting. Start painting, can I just see something here? Yeah, there we go. So, uh... We should grab our, see it's got all the textures here, it's fine. Curvature, uh, ambient occlusion, ID, world space, etc. No normal though, so whatever. Uh, I need to go, okay, just give me a second here because they changed the bit. So we've got the uh, viewer settings, okay? we got the environmental opacity, which is zero. We want to use, um, well, I couldn't, I could basically import something in this case. Uh, I don't want any blur, so let's just say this is the environment. As you can see, the environment is fairly easy on the eyes. And uh, do I have this here? I have the environments here. Yeah, so let's just go ahead and drop this here. So our environments, we got 360 map, drop it down here. Uh, well, only for this project. Current session, even. Oh, my bad. Uh, it's an environment, my friend. There we go. Import this stuff. So uh, let's just drag and drop this onto our. Well, that's, yeah, that, that, that's not going to happen. Um, can we just drag and drop this? Oh, yeah, we can. Of course we can. So this is it. As you can see, this is the exact same. This is 360 map. Obviously, there's a difference in the way it looks, right? Uh, but uh, the 360 map definitely allows us to, uh, you know, really appreciate the, old, the full marvel of um, the world here. Okay. And obviously, uh, you know, light is directly reflective. Obviously, since I've changed the uh, environment map, as you can see, the light has been changed as well. Uh, let's go ahead and grab uh, an old bone, f whatever this is. Light changes here, as you can see. Let's go change it again. Light changes again here as, as well. It's, we're in the desert right now, I think. Yeah, something like the desert here. So there's definitely, uh, you know, the environmental map is very important when it comes to the lighting scene. As you can see over here, we're under the dome here. That's why we don't get a lot of lightning. A lighting even if I rotate a lot of the light right I'm just rotating the light around I'm not gonna get much right so this is like the shaded area this is the brightest that I'm gonna get now if I go back onto the uh, you know bonfacto whatever 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 the fuck this is where is this this is also another shaded area so there's not much of a difference although there are there are some different highlights therefore when you're making this uh, when you're making an asset you and you're actually um, painting it in after that It'd be best if you had your own, if you had a picture, if you've taken a 360 Ansel picture um, with NVIDIA and uh, just exported a panorama and dumped it over here so you could actually see how it would look like inside your 
uh, you know, your uh, a particular environment if you so desire. Obviously, with a live link, it's not a requirement. Says so you could just, you know, whatever you paint, you see how it looks like in the scene. So that's that kind of defeats the purpose. But it is, but it is an option. I just uh, set myself up here. Uh, but it is an option. So if we take a look back into this one, I believe. No. Okay, where the hell is it? Where did it, where did it go? Oh, there we go. As you can see, a much brighter environment, therefore a much more uh, realistic lighting when it comes to outside. As you can see, the sun is shining nicely. You can rotate the thing, right? Uh, so yeah, oops. Uh, definitely, definitely go ahead and uh, have some fun with this. I'm gonna just discard this all this stuff. Um, take a look around the internet. Look at some different maps. Look at different applications, right? Uh, do a little bit of research, especially when it comes to blend modes and uh, texture maps. I really didn't want to talk too long about this. I think it's been about an hour, actually. Um, but, um, yeah, um, we're done with this video. And in the next, we'll start actually working with Painter. I'm going to go over all the Painter stuff. Uh, I just wanted to make sure that you guys understand what a pixel is. Well, it's a tiny square, right? Uh, how color is, uh, you know, stored and encoded. It's encoded in channels, stored in bits. Uh, one bit is zero and one. You've got eight bits per channel, right? Uh, you've got 255 possible, 256 possible combinations between these eight bits because two of the power of two, right? So you've got uh, three channels times 255. This was basically the amount of uh, overall that you have there in terms of values. A channel is not a color, it is only a luminance. Basically, it's a grayscale, right? Um, a grayscale from 0 to 255. And uh, depending on how these two interact between each other, you get different results. Um, what else did I forget to, to tell you, mention? Just want to just wanna cover everything. Just want to make sure that I've covered everything. We've, we went over all the maps, right? We got the albedo, the AO, the bump, the height, the cube map. Displacement map, we got the emissive map, the, the, the light map, right? There's everything, vector displacement map, the parallax map was just the you know, sort of a kill, and obviously the normal map, the most important map of them all. Um, yeah, uh, obviously the blend modes as well, right? You've got your darken mode, the, the uh, brighten modes, and the overlay, etc. all the other modes that are actually combinations of the modes uh, coming beforehand. Um, transparency and opacity, by the way, this is called an alpha, I almost forgot to mention, so, this is the alpha, the black bit. Uh, okay. Um, okay. Are you sh are you shitting me? Look, basically, this the transparent bits are an alpha, right? Anything that is transparent is called an alpha. Just so for the know for the future, all right. Um, so you could you, usually an alpha is depicted as a checkerboard with um, gray squares, gray and white squares. Okay. Uh, all right, guys. I think I think that's enough for this video because I'm, I'm like that's just that's it for me. All right. I'll see you next time. Bye bye.